and welcome to another episode of the Jump Music Initiative podcast. Today we have with us a very special guest, Anna Ruddick, and my co-host, Lisa Jacobs. Welcome. Yay. Hi, Anna. We're so happy to have you here. Um, Anna <laughs> is <laughs> Anna is an incredible upright bassist and electric bassist. She works as a session musician, um, recording on records, a touring artist, um, and she is incredible credentials. So she's played on over 45 records. Um, a couple of really notable ones with Randy Bachman, um, an album that won a Juno with Paul Reddick and a whole bunch of other ones. And uh, she also has toured with a lot of really cool projects, including City and Color, which Maddie was very excited about, and Fifi Dobson, which I think you're the music director for, which is awesome. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, and Anna studied at, hum oh, not Humber, you studied at McGill um, mm -hmm. in the jazz performance program. And now you're doing, you just finished a postgraduate studies yeah. at Humber. Yeah. yeah. And I wrote it down, postgrad in arts admin and cultural management. That's oh, right. We're going to be asking you about what that is later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll explain. <laughs> And um, she also works with the Unison Fund, which we are also going to ask you about, too. So welcome, Anna. Thank you for being here. So happy to talk to other people that are not a three-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anna, tell us, how did you get into um, playing bass guitar and upright bass? Tell us a bit of your music story. I wasn't prepared for this. Um, I guess um, what happened. <laughs> What happened was I was in high school, maybe in grade 11, and I was in school band. I actually played the flute and I was like not super into it anymore because it's, you know, you know, when you're a teenager, things run their course. You're like, OK, I like music, but this is maybe not the best thing for me. And um, I went to a high school that had like a fairly a fairly big music program. It was in, I'm from Saskatchewan. I'm from Regina. So it was like a small town too. So, you know, like you have to find stuff to do and so on. So um, I was in the band room and I found uh, the upright bass there. They had a few of them, the school owned a few of them. And I sort of like started playing it and I really loved it. And I just, I took it home with me and just played it and played it and played it. And within a couple of years, like developed, like I went to a couple of jazz camps or whatever um, in the summer and just really developed like a very keen interest on that instrument. It sort of felt really comfortable right away. So I decided to just really stick it out with it and stay with it. And that was my first kind of foray into what I would do the rest of my life was that upright bass. <laughs> I'm trying to remember any other details. I'm like, I don't know, it's just what I do now. But yeah, it was, I was like 16. Oh man, okay. So you just randomly happened across it. Yeah, it, it was just like, it really called to me and I really loved playing it and I just really worked hard on it because I guess I started a little bit late, but with bass, it's a big instrument. So I think a lot of people started around that age, like not when they're 10 because it would be too large. So yeah. Yes. And you played in a couple of bands. Mm -hmm. that, that's correct. And then you transitioned into being a session musician. Yeah, so after like uh, learning my instrument, I went to McGill, I studied jazz. Um, I still love jazz. It's my favorite kind of music. It's all like, like it's one of the main things I listen to, but it's not, it wasn't like a sustainable career option for me. Um, I felt like it was a really good backbone uh, to have as a musician, all that theoretical knowledge, all that technique is really important. And so studying music to me is a really great way, especially if you're going to be doing what I do and having to learn a lot of songs and be proficient and things like that. It was a really good uh, idea. So um, after jazz school, I, I got an electric bass maybe like soon after uh, jazz school and started playing it. And I like joined a couple cover bands and just played a lot around town. I lived in Montreal just to really get the feel of like other kinds of music and so on. And um, yeah, just worked really hard on just learning as much as I possibly could. And that, like, I'm, Oh, in my very early 20s at this point, and I'm like 21. <laughs> so um, yeah, and then I did start a band with some of my friends, which was like a country band called Ladies of the Canyon. Um, and that band actually ended up getting signed to Warner and we got a record deal. And that was like kind of my introduction to the music industry and meeting producers and being in studios. 
And making my first record with them was like the first time I was in a big professional studio. It was the bathhouse in Kingston, which is the Tragedy Hip Studio. Mm -hmm. And I just knew really soon after going into that experience that that was really something that resonated with me. I was good at it. Um, I liked being in the studio and the producer of that record, Colin Cripps, uh, was like, you're good at this. And I make a lot of records. And he actually just took me under his wing and hired me for a lot of records when I was young. And it, I, all of that experience is really invaluable. So, you know, it, after doing 10 records, you're, it's a very like specific skill that you can't just do, you have to get experience. So I was lucky to have that as a young player um, through that uh, through that experience with him. And yeah, that was just, that was what resonated with me the most in my career was just being in the studio. I really love that. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you a little bit more as a professional musician. So you talked about you, you played the bass throughout school, but I wanted to ask you about your practice regime, actually. Is that something that stayed the same ever since you were in school or what are, what are the most important aspects to you of a practice regime? Right, of course, because we're, um, we're speaking to kind of emerging musicians here. So in university, um, when I was in jazz school, uh, you're learning uh, the whole spectrum of musical theory because jazz is uh, incredibly complex in that way. So, and as a rhythm section player, as a bass player, learning that mathematical structure of everything is really important. So practicing was just a lot of scales, a lot of arpeggios, a lot of really getting inside like chords and upper structure uh, harmony and all of those kind of things to really understand um, your voice leading when you're playing a walking bass line and things like that. I'm not sure how granular you want me to get with that. It's, um, but really technical, technical stuff. Um, as you, as time went on, I would hone in on my, my personal voice as a bass player and things like that. But the foundation of it was always just the technical abilities, um, at, branching out into different kinds of music as time went on. Um, my biggest thing learning jazz, jazz school and school is one thing learning the fundamentals of harmony and the fundamentals of how to play your instrument are extremely important. But once you're, once you go into the world of playing, the most important thing that you can possibly do is uh, play with people and in situations as much as you possibly can. And like joining a cover band that plays five nights a week of, is, was incredibly uh, educational for me. You have to learn a million songs and, and do that whole gigging all the time. As a young player in university, even I would gig at restaurants, you know, make $40 to play three sets every night. And then you move on and you play the rock gigs, like the cover gigs, all those things, just being on stage, playing with people, getting with people, jamming with people, became more of the focal point afterwards. Do I practice now? Um, no, I'm a mom, so I don't usually practice very much. I also have a very busy career. So I uh, going into a gig, I often have to learn like 45 of somebody's songs or whatever. So, you know, I'm spending hours and hours doing that. Um, getting the songs inside of my head. Um, if there's something technical I can't do um, or something that I'm not comfortable with, that's the only time I sort of sit down and woodshed that technique or that thing that I, I'm not able to do it, like with the finesse. I like to be very, very comfortable and very fluid as a player. It's very important not to be second guessing anything you're about to do um, physically on your instruments. Um, so I sort of, I sort of play as I go in terms of practicing. I work on stuff if I need to work on it. Otherwise, in normal times, I'm just always playing. So it's mm -hmm. sort of like that. But yeah, th sometimes it's like, oh, this thing's getting a little bit rusty. So um, for example, I, I play in like a sort of metal, prog metal band. Um, and there's it's very fast, those kind of riffs, metal riffs. So. I would probably specifically pick some of those ones out and practice them, maybe go up and down with them and do something like that just to physically, it's like being an athlete, you know, you just have to <laughs> really get the stuff under your fingers. I hope that helps. I've never really discussed that before, but I suppose, yeah, just um, keeping up with the demand on you as a musician is really, really important. It's so important to, to really be fluid. And the best way that you can do that for yourself is the best way. And oftentimes, like, if you're not sure, take a lesson with somebody that you think knows a bit more than you do. <laughs> You're never too old to do that. Well, that's great. Um, I also wanted to ask you, as, as a session player, when 
you're working with different people. What do you think are some of the key characteristics that artists look for when they're hiring someone to play on their record? And what are some key things that you can do as a session player or side musician to make sure that you get hired again? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, usually being really nice and uh, <laughs> um, uh, showing up on time, uh, having the appropriate gear with you, those are fundamental things. Um, when you're in the studio, you want to be very open-minded. You don't want to um, have an idea in your head of how something's going to be. And especially if you're a side person, you have to evolve with what's happening there because things change and things get added and like a song might sound totally different. You just have to be very, very, very adaptable and be very calm about that as well. Um, drop your ego, leave it at the door, don't bring it in there with you, um, things like that. And just be really, really respectful. Um, a lot of artists, they're artists, right? They're musicians. These, these people that are hiring you are very emotional. They are spending a lot of money they don't have enough time because it's expensive. You know what I mean? And that they've, they've prepared this much or this much and we don't know what's gonna happen. So you have to keep an open mind going into the studio with different artists, especially a lot of the time it's somebody you don't know personally, right? So you're, you're, this is a very intimate thing that you're doing with them. And um, you have to be mindful of that, of that really, that intimacy that you have with this art, you're playing on their record, you know, like they're, you're making their music sound better. Um, if they criticize something that you're doing and they don't do it in a way that would normally be polite or something like that. I mean, that rarely happens. I think people, especially in this industry are so kind to one another, but it's, emo it's an emotional response and you just kind of have to roll with it. Um, you are hired by them. It's not your show. So that's some, just really, really important stuff to keep in mind. And, you know, just be like, be your creative self. There's people that are more, have a more idiosyncratic way of playing and people that I kind of have a very personal style the way I play. Some people are just more like utilitarian. It's just the kind of musician that you are, accept that and do that and do that really, really well. And don't try to do two kinds of music you don't know how to play and things like that. That's really important as well because you should be sticking to the things you know best if that helps at all. Oh. Yeah, that was really, that's really great advice, especially the adaptability part. That's mm -hmm. really yeah. standing out for me. Yeah. And just the intimate nature of me creating music. Yeah. Thank you for highlighting that. Okay. Live or studio. Do you have a preference? Yeah, I like studio better. I think I always hey. have, even as, a, even as a young player, um, I like playing live with people that I really know and connect with. I love that experience. Um, I don't love playing with people that I don't know that well, um, but I love I love playing really, really great music and I've done it in all kinds of non-ideal circumstances and things like that, but I'm not an extrovert. So like Lisa, when she's on stage, I'm like, oh my God, like I can't. <laughs> I love it, but I'm like, I can't do what you do. I am an introvert. So it's an extrovert and introvert. Because in this industry, we all have to be like mm -hmm. very on our social game. But it's like, it's it's tough. It's not nerves. It's just about, I don't think that I'm an entertaining player. I think that I'm more of an introspective player. And I just, I, I love the studio more than anything. I, I couldn't even compare it to playing live. I don't like it as much. Okay. But I like I was... friends. Mm -hmm. That intimacy, that connection. I like playing improvised music. Like, I like playing with like Paul Reddick, for example, because you know everybody in the band are my best friends, and we go off on like tangents, and it's we play small clubs, and it's dark, and it's just really really fun. I like it to be no pressure. But you know, I've obviously had to play like arena tours as well, and I do love that. But it's maybe in a different way. Okay. Right. Yeah. I wasn't sure how you were going to answer that. Yeah, not live. <laughs> Very cool, because you've done so many incredible things live. So really great. OK, um, Anna mentioned that she's a mom. And uh, you are also currently pregnant, right? I am, yeah. OK, so you have like one and a half babies right now. Yes. <laughs> Having another um, one in like three months. <laughs> OK, amazing. So yeah. one of the things that I really noticed and that we don't have an opportunity to talk to or hear from are um, musicians who are gig workers, who play for other people, who tour 
who are also pregnant and have to deal with not having maternity leave and um, having a small child and going on the road. And you were someone that didn't fall out of the, the business before you did all of those things. You're doing them while you're still in the business. And I want to hear about your journey in this department, all the yeah, things. That's, that's cool. Um, so <laughs> I have like a lot of schools of thought on this. I did work um, when I was pregnant. Um, I just worked normally. Like I did, I, it's so funny cause I'm pregnant. I'm like over six months pregnant right now. And I've made like maybe two records. Like when I was pregnant with Lenny, my three-year-old, I probably like, I was like all over the place. I did like 10 records. Like I was on tour in Europe at one point. <laughs> like After I had Lenny, I did bring her up between um, when she, between like six months and a year and a bit. Um, it's a uh, touring with people I was really comfortable with that were okay with it would bring me on tour with her uh, and my mom would come. My parents are obviously like older and they're retired. So they really helped me when I would go away. When I went away with, uh, with Dallas, with City in Color, he would only do when he hired me, he was like, your mom, what's going on with that? And I was just like really honest with him. Like how long are the stretches of touring? And you know, they weren't um, more than a few weeks at a time. Like there'd be, you'd come home. And so it was fine. Um, and you know, with that band, I wouldn't bring her. She was a bit older. I would bring her if we would fly to our, do our US tour and we would be in Nashville for a week rehearsing. I would bring my mom and her there, but they, they, she wouldn't come on the road. Cause it's like a tour bus full of men and nobody has kids and like, you don't bring your kids around people that don't have kids. It doesn't work. But um, everyone was really like easy going about it. It's just with something like that group where it's really, really foreign to them, they would just ask like, and you know, I wouldn't bring it up a lot and things like that. You just kind of keep it like, you have to read the situation. If you're working with people that don't have children or it, you know, the, the people that don't have children or have chosen not to, you don't bring your stress about that into that situation because it, it's not their problem. So you really have to just like keep it, keep the two things separate. And I think that's really doable. And if it's not, then choose a different way. You know what I mean? It's, you have to be really personal about it and it, you can't expect people to cater to you. Mm -hmm. some people will and some people will not and it's if the people that won't it's completely fine and the people that do it's like be really thankful because um this woman Erin Costello that I work with I was pregnant when I made her record with her and her band were very close-knit and I brought Lenny on, on tour with her with my mom like in Canada on the road and you know she rented two vans and it was really really fun and, and enjoyable and she was at an age where she, it wasn't problematic and she, her sleeping was normal and she was a really easy child and didn't um didn't wake up at night and things like that so if you have a child if you have a child who does those things and it wouldn't be possible to bring them on the road without it being disruptive then you have to recognize that it's really up to you you have to be it's really every man for themselves in the music world. So you have to be really mindful of that, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but I didn't have too many problems. You just have to be really strong and really capable. And if you have a family support system, that's really helpful. Um, my parents were extremely helpful, obviously, um, so that I could leave her behind and things like that. And as they get older, you can't leave for as long. <laughs> so um, I, I remember we were, I was playing a gig at the, the, at Levon Helm's studio barn thing, the, the ramble down there and his daughter, Amy was there. And Amy Helm has a couple of sons, I believe. And she was talking to me about um, parenting and she, she was explaining this because Lenny was really, really young at the time when she said, as they get older, they're gonna get mad when you leave. Mm -hmm. And you have to be, you have to like decide make those decisions as you go as a parent, because it's not the same as when they're a little baby and you can leave them behind, you know, it's going to change and you have to roll with it. And it was really good advice from her because, you know, I never thought about that. It was always just something I was doing, but it's true. You have to kind of gauge the way that your child is and you can't expect that it's going to be okay. It's, sometimes it's not with certain children. So my next child maybe wouldn't be able to go on the road. Maybe it's a, she's a screamer. <laughs> maybe she doesn't sleep well. I don't know, but the bottom line is um, you can't expect people to cater to it. Um, there's no mat leave. So I was on stage three weeks after I had Lenny um, and that was hard. I had a C-section, so I was in pain. Um, I don't know. I, I think you were asking how people could make it easier. And I think that it's not up to musicians to make it easier to hire somebody that's a parent. I think it's up to like, 
the infrastructure of like self-employed versus EI. And like, I think there needs to be a better way for self-employed people to get, have access to maternity leave and things like that, or some kind of uh, grant system available. Um, there's just nothing there. And it's really difficult to um, put that on the artists and things like that. So I'm not sure, but it would be nice to have mat leave, but there, it, it doesn't exist. You know, you have to figure that out in advance. I wish I had better news for people that are parents, but it really is, a, you really do have to kind of do it on your own and figure it out yourself. Thank okay. You. Your yeah. insults. <laughs> awesome. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about going into the studio and playing on people's records. Is the process usually similar um, between different artists or do some people prefer different things? Like they prefer you to come to rehearsals beforehand or some people like you to jump right in. Is the preparation going into the studio, does it vary between different artists? Yeah, um, it does in that if you're making a record um, with like as sort of as a live off the floor as a band, you probably have pre-production first um, to figure out like all the riffs and all that kind of stuff and really get together as a band if you're recording everything like really really live um but not always i find most of the time i go into the studio there's no preparation people don't send their songs ahead of time and things like that um you just go in and uh it, it gets kind of done on the spot generally speaking um i often go in and like everything's done and i'm just putting bass on something that is already there that happens a lot maybe if the bass that they had at the beginning was like a scratch that the engineer did or something like that and they want something a bit more exciting um but generally speaking if it's like just a singer songwriter making a record i go just go in and i hear this stuff that um day so that's the importance of really like no, learning, learning, a, having a way to memorize and, and sort of retain things really like you don't have to retain them for very long, but you have to retain them for a few hours and things like that. Just really being able to do that is important because you don't want a bunch of charts in front of you and you want to be able to look at everybody if it's not COVID and you're not like, <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I find you, you go in cold. It's, it's great. At first it's jarring. And then you learn to really love that part. Actually, you're like, what's going to happen today? What's the music going to sound like? It's really kind of fun. Amazing. And yeah. when you're um, working with an artist, how do you sort of balance staying true to kind of your own style of playing and your artistry with theirs and kind of what they want it to sound like? Is there, how do you make it still fulfilling for both the artist and you in that creative scenario? Um, I'm not sure that it like it, it's not about it being fulfilling for me. I, I'm, I like doing that job. So I'm always fulfilled by it. Um, generally somebody hire at this stage, somebody's hiring me because they want the bass to sound like the way that I play it. So I usually just kind of do my thing or if I'm given like a, an idea of a part, I just kind of play around with that. Um, but I'm really just listening to what they want and Otherwise, if they are hiring me, they probably want me to come up with the typical kind of stuff I would play. <laughs> My usual bullshit, I don't know. So it's kind of, yeah, like kind of, if that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They kind of come to expect um, your style from you. <laughs> yeah. They hire you, that's, that's great. I like that. Yeah, like my little quirky things I do, they want <laughs> I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I do. I do. Do you have a, like, did you work on creating a signature kind of sound and style or did that just evolve naturally? Um, I think it evolved naturally. Yeah. Through just the kind of music I was playing and that I liked listening to. Um, yeah. I think it just kind of happened naturally. Yeah, I've, I've heard so many people kind of talk about you need to find like a style and something that is like your, your thing that you do. And I hear them tell young people that and I'm always like, do people actually like work at finding that or is that just what ends up happening? I think it's what so, ends okay. up happening. But yeah, right. OK, so like I have to stress enough. It's like the, the story I told you about my band getting signed and working with a producer that was like, oh, I'm going to hire you to play sessions. It's like this this job is so right place at right time. So mm -hmm. if you get lucky enough to be playing a lot, you're going to develop that sound. But 
you know, I was given a lot of creative opportunities as a young player. So I really honed in on something because I had the luxury of doing that, but not everyone's going to have that experience. It just depends. Um, but as an artist, like if we're just talking about somebody that's like doing what we do and get, getting hired to play with people, um, it, it could go either way, or you could sort of just really learn a solid foundation and it can kind of evolve as you go. But um, I think it does happen naturally. I don't know if there's a way to cultivate it at home. I think it's that thing where you just have to be playing in, in situations. You got to get in the situations as much as you possibly can. And I believe that as young players, that can happen at a rehearsal space where you're just jamming every day with your friends. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing. And then, you know, there's lots of places to go out and play. Well, not, <laughs> not right now. But <laughs> yeah, just get that, get the jamming going, get your friends together and play and like, get people that are writing songs and play with them and play, play, play with people in rooms, play in front of people. Like that'll be the fastest way to get uh, your rhythm as a player and as a signature kind of the, kind of learn how you navigate around the music as a player. Absolutely. Agree with you a hundred percent, especially yeah. as a bass player. It's not that fun playing by yourself in your room alone. No. <laughs> it's so boring. Um, okay. So you have found some incredible successes as a live performer and um, playing on records. And now you're adding some new things into um, your music career. So tell yeah. us about going into school and um, why you're doing a little bit of a shift and tell us a little bit about your program and what it is. Well, COVID is what made everything impossible. So I was like, let's go. I was thinking for a while um, as Lenny was getting a little bit older about going back to school and I had a break in touring. So I was like, oh, I just heard a loud noise. Was that me? No, I, I had a break in touring and it was like, I was applying for different programs. I have an undergrad. So I was like, do I do a master's in something unrelated to music? And then I had a friend that was like, I did this program in arts administration and cultural management at Humber. And I was like, Humber is great. Like I know all these musicians that went to Humber and they're fucking great. And they're so smart and they like, they're really well-rounded people. So I checked it out and I was like, okay, like I'm going to learn how to use Microsoft Excel and how to do like you know, how the, how nonprofit arts organizations work and like the whole infrastructure behind the grant system in Canada and all these very important skills that are very interesting that as a musician, I didn't know any of that stuff. Like I knew it a bit, but it was like, uh, I was incredibly like this really like nurturing knowledge filled program, just learning about the other side of the industry. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about it kind of like, well, you know, like when athletes retire and they go like work at the sports network or they become coaches, I'm like, <laughs> maybe I should like go work in the music industry job because <laughs> I don't really want to go on tour, but like, and COVID was happening. So I went into this program and it was excellent. And in the winter, they want you to find a work placement. So I I had written this research paper on the Unison Fund, which is a uh, Canada's like music uh, music charity. It's an it's a it's a crisis relief charity for artists. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people that had applied before. You know, like you have a bad month and you can't pay your dental bill or you need counseling. Unison pays for musicians to have all of those services that we don't get through our jobs because we're uninsured contract workers that have like this really unstable situation and. I just thought they were just so heroic and all of that. Um, not to be dramatic, but I just really do believe, I just was like so blown away by this organization and um, its founders. And I called them, the executive director, and asked her if I could intern there. And she was like, yeah, we're obviously really busy because it's COVID and everyone's in fucking crisis. Like everyone in the whole industry started for swearing, I can't stop. Um, <laughs> so she was so awesome Amanda Power and she was like yeah you can come intern here like we, we I, you know she's like you do all these things in the music industry and we need an allocations coordinator somebody to go through the applications for funding and you know I'm like I know what musicians do and this is going to be great and I like I learned so much working there um, and I'm still there yeah and it was so funny going into like a, my first administration job when I'm 37 years old. I'm like, <laughs> like just so like green, but like the exec director was just super helpful. And I like my, my program taught me all of those like technical things. I'm so obsessed with like technical details about how to do things. Mm -hmm. Like it's so important to know 
just the ins and outs of everything. And I was learning that from my program. And then I learned the nuances of how you, the workflows and all of that that happened in, in, in a charity or not-for-profit organization. And it's been really amazing. And I just feel like it's something I'm growing with really well. And it's something I really like and something I really believe in, which is important because, you know, moving to the other side of things can be kind of disillusioning. And I just feel really passionately about what Unison does. So it's really good. And um, it's really good for me to be able to do that right now when um, I don't want to be on tour. I can't be, uh, nobody can be because <laughs> of COVID, but um, yeah, I'm just really shifting to like more family focused living and you know, that kind of thing. So it's really like nice to be able to do this and be giving back to, to the community that I've existed in for 15 years. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's called the Unison Fund. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's the Unison Benevolent Fund when I, yeah. I think sort of rebranding is just the Unison Fund right now. And yeah, it's a music uh, crisis relief charity. Um, and the program that you're in school for is called, just in case people are interested in researching uh, some of this it's stuff. It's the uh, postgraduate program at Humber in arts administration and cultural management. So it's really a program in um, administ like arts management, working at not-for-profits, working at, um, you know, uh, local arts organizations, national arts organizations, provincial, like the Canada Council for the Arts, for example, you know, that like, if you wanted to have a job doing something like that, or a grant or factor, any of those kind of things, this kind of program is you learn about how that kind of stuff works, basically. And all of the details of how you work an office job, basically, like the technology and all that kind of stuff, too. But um, a, yeah, so if you have an undergrad, you can apply to be in this program and it, it's, a, it's 12 months. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That sounds like a really good it was, program. It's great. Awesome. So we have a segment on the show that we do called Desert Island Albums, which is kind of fun. And I just want to ask you, it, it's kind of like essential listening. Um, what would you choose as three albums or three musical works that you would take with you if you were trapped on a desert island? Um, that's really tough. I don't know. I'm like, I like so many different things. Um, I think like my favorite, I'm like, <laughs> it's gonna be like nerdy jazz albums, probably. I'm like, Bill Evans, Live at the Village Vanguard, Sunday at the Village Vanguard. Um, my favorite Joni Mitchell record, which is Shadows and Light, the live album, which has been my favorite album since I was like 15 years old. I love it. Um, and then like, I'm trying to think of like another record that's like not like those ones. It would probably be, oh my God. I'd want to take like some kind of like 70, like I'm like faces. Uh, you guys are putting me on the spot. <laughs> I mean, two is great. If you want to stop at two, that's amazing. <laughs> I think I'd bring the Derek and the Dominoes record, Layla. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Anna. You had so much wonderful insight, and we hear something new every time, and that's great. Your experience is so unique. And um, you've already given so much insight, but if there's one thing you want to leave off with, the next generation of young musicians, just a piece of advice or two, what would you say? You could even think about it like, what would you say to your past self when you were just kind of starting out in the industry? Um, don't, I'm trying to think about this. It's like, don't do things in this career that don't work or don't make you feel like you're working towards something. Um, important or that will or that has longevity if something is feeling I don't want to use a buzzword but if something is toxic or something's not working for you I think it's important not to do it it's really really like life is really short this industry is really hard um, you have to try to make a living and you're not going to make a living doing something that makes you unhappy um, and there's a lot of things you can do in this job as a musician that will make you unhappy um, if you don't like touring with somebody, if you don't like the band you're in, you're not getting along. Um, if you feel like things are unfair in some way, there's probably something better that you could be doing. Um, also work really, 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 really hard. Um, you have to really 
just know what you're doing. You have to practice really hard. You have to get your technical skills together. So you don't have to think about things when you're doing them. It's just so, um, it's just so unforgiving out there. Um, but it is possible to do this for a living. It's very possible. It's very fulfilling. Um, and another thing that I can mention is like, if you're like, kind of like myself or like Lisa, where you're, you're a hired gun, so to speak, hired musician, um, it's a, it, you do it for a long time before you make any real money doing it. Um, you know, you have to be prepared that your adult years are gonna happen a little bit later. Um, Cause you have to put in a lot of, a lot of, you have to pay your dues and put in a lot of years into this job. It's really doesn't happen every time when you're 25, you know? You, it, I don't know if that resonates with you, but it's absolutely, it sure does. Your adult years happen a little later. They do. And I, you know, yeah. that's true of every art, like we're artists, you know, we're, we're, we're not, we, that's just the way that we are in general, but um, finding that stability, but you also don't need the stability and even at a certain point, you know, I never had it. And then at one point I wanted it. So I restructured things. You have to sort of be really crafty and really figure it out. But yeah, just don't remain in situations that make you um, un unhappy or uncomfortable um, ever because it's not worth it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is good advice. I think I needed to hear that as well. Thank you. Yeah. We all need to hear that. Her. Yeah. Yeah, we all need to hear that, but it is possible. And, um, you know, there, it's the dumbest thing that you'll like to say, but like, you really like, you should laugh at me when I say this, but it is no joke that you have to believe in yourself, like hard mm -hmm. and know that this is like, you're good at it. And cause there's going to be times when people tell you that you are not, and it like probably isn't cause you're not good at it. It's probably for some other reason. Or maybe you sounded bad that day, or maybe you're not good at this one thing that you're doing. Um, and learn when you're know, like, okay, I'm not good at this aspect of things. Let's not do that anymore. You know, things like that. But you have to believe in your own thing that you're doing really hard um, because there's going to be days when you're the only person that does. And that's, you know, that's really important to be kind to yourself and know that, that, uh, that what you're doing is important and it's the best thing that you could be doing. And you're always going to get better. So if you feel insecure, just work on it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Anna, for doing this and coming on here and sharing some wisdom with us. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh.